Welcome everyone. I am Tawny Hunt Ferrarini. I am here on behalf of the John W. Hammond Institute for Free Enterprise, and you are joining us tonight for the Lang Langenberg Speaker Series with Peter Betke, who's going to be talking about the struggle for a better world. Before we get started, let's just go through what we are going to cover today and give you an idea of what to expect. Of course, I'm going to give you a warm welcome on behalf of the Hammond Institute here at Lindenwood University, but we also have various co-hosts. They will introduce themselves during their fireside chat with Pete Becky. I'll introduce our speaker tonight, Pete Becky. He will go on to speak about the struggle for a better world. And then we'll proceed with the fireside chat. And of course, we'll conclude with a Q&A from the Zoom audience. Last but certainly not least, we'll bid you farewell and give you ideas on how to stay connected. And with that, I encourage all of you to learn more about the Hammond Institute. Just hop online using your favorite browser and go to the hammondinstitute.org or find us on social media using the hashtag Hammond Inst. You will find and discover that the Hammond Institute provides a comprehensive list of different activities. We do research, we host these speaker series, we write op-eds, we do policy research. We have a free enterprise academy for high school and college students outside of the discipline of economics. And last but certainly not least, we have a series of programs for high school teachers, community college instructors, and undergraduate professors who are teaching survey of economics courses. So find out more about us at thehammondinstitute.org. We want to say special thanks to Harry and his wife, Nina Langenberg, who join us tonight, along with John and Barb Hammond, who are also in our virtual audience. It's through people like this and supporters like the Langenbergs, as well as the Hammonds, that allow us to bring the speaker series to you. Our goal is to engage individuals with opportunities to discuss important topics, topics that are both intellectual and practical and they may at times lead to civil debate. This is the beginning of our 21-22 academic year, and we plan to host other events, both virtual and in-person, so please stay in touch with us. Tonight, for the first time, we are joining the other groups, Concordia University, Northern Michigan University, Northwood University, New Jersey City University and West Virginia University and offering Peter Betke to all of you for an engaging conversation on the struggle for a better world. So I'm gonna ask each of these co-hosts to place in the chat box below in Zoom your contact information. And if you would stay in touch with them throughout our presentation. And with that, I now turn to Pete Betke. Of course, he doesn't need an introduction to many of us, whether we're a faculty scholar, a teaching professor, we're an undergraduate student or graduate student. We either know Pete in person or through his various works. He's going to be talking about the struggle for a better world today. You can't see that, but you can find it on Amazon someplace. No, you can't see the book. Oh, there you saw a flash of it. <laughs> anyway, you can find it on Amazon. It's one of those reads that you'll constantly keep close to you and you'll pick it up, read a chapter, think about it, go back to it, um, take a, a serious look at some of his footnotes and you digest it over time. And I think that you're going to find that that's going to be true with what Pete talks about today. All of you know Pete primarily from George Mason University, where he calls the Department of Economics his home. He is highly ranked among various scholars. Um, he is cited thousands and thousands of times in a year. So with not more introduction is needed, I'm going to turn to Pete. And Pete, go ahead and talk, if you would, for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then we'll turn to our co-hosts, and they'll ask questions. Sound good? 
That sounds fantastic. While I get a chance to share my screen, Tawny, I uh, <clears throat> will uh, just uh, like to take a moment and point out that um, I knew Harry Langenberg. Um, when I was a graduate student, I was in charge of a publication for the Center for the Study of Market Processes. And because of that, I got to know uh, Harry. And in the process of getting to know him, I was signed up for his uh, yearly or, you know, little, uh, he sent out these booklets, these reports. They were pink, uh, small little pamphlets, but they were very fascinating because they were provided economic trends uh, discussions. And one of the things I'm going to hopefully get back to in the discussion here today um, as I when I go through my slides is, is to actually address this issue of having to do with uh, three things that I think are important for our world to deal with at the moment, which is um, the issue of, of a fiscal irresponsibility and how that shows up in what's called intergenerational accounting, uh, monetary mischief and the balance sheet of the Fed. And the third thing is the sort of structural impediments to market progress that are created by having more and more of a privileged economy rather than a contract-based economy. So anyway, I, I need to, uh, how do I get to share my screen now? Okay. Here I go. Okay. And I cannot until the other stop sharing. There we go. All right, share screen. Okay, everyone should see my screen now. I'm uh, absolutely thrilled to be here and I greatly appreciate the opportunity uh, that the Hammond Institute um, is providing. Um, this is my new book that was published in 2021 uh, called The Struggle for a Better World. It's made up of a series of lectures that I have given from 2000 to 2020. And it's bookended by a new introduction and a new conclusion by myself addressing some of the current uh, issues. Um, the term struggle in the book is, is, has a, a dual meaning. Uh, the first meaning is that I wanna communicate to students and fellow scholars is that um, you know, we are lifelong learners. That's one of the things that we must commit ourselves to. Um, uh, Kate's here, uh, she knew, knows Vernon Smith very well. One of the first things that you notice when you meet Vernon Smith is that he's a lifelong learner. Uh, and when you interact with him, you know, he's always got fresh information that he has absorbed and, and, and addressed. And that's what we try to strive to be as, as scholars and as scientists, and that the quest to understand the human condition is unending and it's difficult and our knowledge is always at the edge of discovery as well as at the edge of error. And, you know, we just got to embrace that aspect of it. And I think if we do that and we communicate to the, to the curiosity of our students, we become better teachers as well. And we become better scholars by being better teachers. Um, we are also citizens in a society and uh, we are striving to continually perfect an imperfect uh, a set of solutions uh, to fulfill the liberal plan of equality, liberty, and justice. That's Adam Smith's term, the liberal plan of equality, liberty, and justice. And it's in, in that project and in the Enlightenment project more in general that we continue to strive and, 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 and stumble towards uh, better solutions, including revising old solutions because the world has changed and we have to adapt and adjust to the changing world. And so it's in this two sense that we're constantly struggling that I want to try to communicate in the uh, essays in the, in the book. Um, a contrasting view of economics here is um, A.C. Pagu, who was a leading economist. He was a, a student, a protege of Alfred Marshall. In the English speaking world, Alfred Marshall dominated economics. Uh, from the 1890s until uh, roughly uh, into the end of the 1930s. Um, so for a very long period of time, this is A.C. Pagu. And what he suggests is that if, uh, unless economics can be a science that can improve, 
So note in my discussion, I have economic science being about understanding the human condition and being a citizen about striving to try to, to fix things. I hopefully I will elaborate more on that. But what Pagu is saying is that uh, our philosopher's impulse must give way um, in order for us to have a the knowledge basically of physician. He believes that the economist must be a physician to society or an economist must be an engineer of society. And that's different. Uh, and that's part of the battle that I have waging uh, throughout my book is between these two paradigms. You know, one paradigm, which is the way Jim Buchanan would put it, is the exchange paradigm versus the allocation paradigm or the social engineering paradigm versus a social understanding paradigm and, and which way economics goes in that regard. Um, why liberalism in economics? It's because this is a, a old book by Lionel Robbins um, called e The Theory of Economic Policy. And one of the important points of that book is to highlight how it is that there's a co-evolution of the two liberalisms. Uh, a lot of economics, you know, when you are a, a young student of economics and introduced to economics, the framework will be treated as given. Uh, we begin in a world of enforceable, exchangeable property rights. You know, again, think about the idea of a mutually beneficial exchange. In order for a mutually beneficial exchange to get off the ground, we have to already recognize a mine and dine, right? <laughs> you know, I have a right to this, you have a right to that. We swap it, we exchange based on those exchange of those property rights. And so we tend to assume enforceable and exchangeable property rights, or what David Hume referred to, the great Scottish philosopher David Hume referred to it as property contract and consent. And one of the things that I think is a failing of economics that needed to be corrected was when you treat a framework as given, you often end up by forgetting it. So you treat it so much as given that you then are going to have to then forget it unless you bring it back. And so Tawney's professor, Doug North, was a major person at bringing the framework back into focus. Armin Alchin of UCLA was a major person at bringing the framework back into focus. Jim Buchanan, my teacher, was a major person at bringing it you know, back into focus. And F.A. Hayek was already there before all three of those people that I just mentioned, stressing the idea that you need to have this framework of property, contract, and consent. And so once we recognize that we have to analyze the framework rather than treating it as given, we also have to, for our economics, we should never be content with treating those institutions as given, but must use the tools of economic reasoning for us to be able to study the frameworks and the importance of their frameworks. And so that the first thing is to understand the framework. The second thing is for us to understand the economic processes that take place within the framework. And that's, once we do that, that, that turns a different, sort of sheds different light on the way we think about economic science. And the essays in this volume are all trying to do that. And what I want to stress in there is that there's nothing about the way that we classical economists, early neoclassical economists, new institutional economists, Austrian economists, in our framework that doesn't actually care about the least advantage in society. In fact, the normative benchmark is always how do the least advantage in society get lifted up? You know, the great, great economist Milton Friedman was famous for saying that, in, you know, in a rising tide, all boats are lifted, right? Why did he worry about all the boats being lifted is because you're judging the, the, the uh, effectiveness of the policies based on how well they take a, a, a care of the least advantage. So we're always trying to maximize human flourishing and minimize human suffering. As Adam Smith says here, you know, no society can surely be flourishing and happy of which the far greater part of the members are poor and miserable. So the social ills that exist in the world are things that we economists care about and trying to understand. And so the question has always been, what's the most effective way to maximize human flourishing and minimize human suffering against uh, the, uh, the constraints of nature? 
coordinating disparate and, and uh, distant and disparate individuals, assuring cooperation among strangers, and raising the welfare of the least advantage. And so it's extremely important and part of the argument in my book that I really stress a lot is that you have to remember is that Adam Smith's economics was born as a critique of the privileged system of mercantilism. And the birth of economic liberalism is the same vein as that of political liberalism, which is the eradication of obstacles created by power and privilege to enable the rise of commercial society to lift humanity from the misery of poverty. And that should be subjugation, subjugation by unchecked authority. I didn't do enough spell check there. Uh, so it should be, should be subjugation. So this is Smith's liberal plan. And, and now the idea is, how do we reconstruct that plan for our day today, for our world today? I won't go into this too much. Um, this is, I, I would run out of time, I think, but uh, basically the Smithian system is a robust system and it's robust both at an institutional level. We try to find institutions that will generate the good society, even when people deviate from ideal behavior but it's also an intellectually robust system, which is that it can demonstrate the power of the argument even when we give our opponents their greatest and most charitable due, all right? And that, that both this institutional robustness and this intellectual robustness is part of what the Smithian system is all about. This is a long quote from Hayek. Again, I won't read the whole thing, but if you if you look here, his main idea is that the chief concern of, of, of Smith and his contemporaries was so that bad men can do least harm, not that you would have great men be able to do great things. It was the system was set up so that bad men could do least harm rather than to uh, uh, um, sort of uh, give the best and the brightest the greatest amount of power to achieve things. You know, I understand I might run out of time, you know, and everything. So I want to be very, very clear to the audience here, like what a good takeaway is. And here's a good takeaway, which is that the system that Smith is trying to get at, which I'm trying to talk about, is one that allows the greatest amount of freedom to ordinary people to be able to do extraordinary things. The alternative paradigm is to give the greatest amount of power to extraordinary people so they can do extraordinary things. OK, and the contrast between those two visions um, is is basically sort of what's being played out in my book. So I don't want to give power to the extraordinary people. <laughs> I don't trust giving the power to the extraordinary people to do extraordinary things. I trust the average everyday person to be able to do extraordinary things if they are given the freedom and the scope to do so in their lives. And part of the issue here is that socialism is not the answer. And socialism is not the answer because it cannot work. It does not and it cannot work. And so it's just simply a wrong alternative for thinking about how you can improve the human condition. The science of economics has identified fundamental flaws with that program. And it doesn't matter, by the way, if contemporary advocates of the program put the modifier democratic in front of it. The reality is, is that earlier generations all called themselves democratic socialists too. And the audience should get ready here. The term Soviet is actually a worker's democracy. You have to understand that, that, that term, right? And, and the reason why they're called the Bolsheviks is they were the majority for one vote, right? The, and what was the alternative? The Mensheviks, which is the minority, all right? This was about giving control over to the, to the, to the workers. And in order to organize, and it was workers' democracy that was supposed to be getting done. But let's not even go on the totalitarian Soviet experiments. How about in Britain, you know, where the market socialist model was all about? Every single one of those advocates said, we are, in fact, socialists in our economics because we are liberal Democrats in our politics. The reason why Hayek had to write the road to serfdom wasn't to beat back the totalitarian threat of the communists in, in Soviet Russia. It was to actually identify to his British colleagues the tragedy of that their efforts 
to try to bring socialism to mix with democracy would end up by leading to a contradiction which they as, demo as Democrats would find abhorrent. That's why it's a tragedy. The road to serfdom is a tragic tale, not an inevitable tale. All right. That, that's, uh, you know, it's it, it's it's a very important to understand what's going on in that book. So I'm trying to wrap up very quickly here. So one of the themes in my book is in this 20 year period from 2000 to 2020 is that we liberals, we radical classical liberals have, in fact, uh, messed up. And the reason why we messed up is we forgot that politics is downstream from culture. And part of that is because we adopted a too much of a triumphalist attitude after the fall of communism. This, by the way, is street art that's been motivated since the world, since post uh, uh, 2010 and the, and the financial crisis and the growing concerns with inequality. And what it says is help, this economy is killing us. This is the current tacit presuppositions in our world. So think about a young kid that's sitting in my class right now. They're 18 years old. They have no idea that there was such a thing as the Berlin Wall, except for maybe when they see it on a, uh, uh, you know, uh, on, a, on a history film, right? Uh, they never experienced communism in real practice. Um, what have they experienced in their life? They know the U.S. economy has been a permanent war economy since 9-11. Uh, they know that they've had a financial crisis. They know that there's been a rising concern of inequality. They know, and, and globalization. They know that there's a global pandemic, right? That's their tacit presuppositions. That's the world that they come into an economics class with in the back of their head. That's different from the world I came into. I'm 61 years old right now. What was the world that I came into, right? The, you know, at just coming to, to consciousness, the Vietnam War, right? Watergate, all right? Uh, uh, you know, Jimmy Carter, you know, having to escape his canoe because the bunny was going to, you know, bite him or whatever, right? And so then for the people on Saturday Night Live would making fun of Jimmy Carter or Jerry Ford or whoever, and, and politicians were an object of ridicule, not an object of, of uh, you know, something to look at. And then you had stagflation, all right. Um, it, you know, in the, in the late 1970s, when I showed up at college, it was very, you know, common to think that you might not be able to get a job after you got out of college. Right. And, and all these things. So the economy was constantly something that people cared about. So, of course, my tacit presuppositions was to stand up there. I, as a as a as a undergraduate student, how I got interested in economics was I spent the summer before I showed up at Grove City College digging pools. And there was gas shortages. So we had to actually siphon gasoline. And I was the youngest person on the crew. So who got to siphon the gasoline? Me. And so Senholtz, my teacher, in the very first week of classes, starts explaining why it is that there's gas lines in America. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm hooked. Right. Because but that was my you know, I had all this tacit presuppositions. And then this this man could explain in a brilliant way why it is that I experienced the world that I experienced. So how are we going to do that with the students that we have today who have known 9-11, the global financial crisis, the, you know, the Occupy Wall Street and then, you know, the global pandemic. So how are we going to address it? That as economic educators, as economic communicators, that's what we have to wrestle with. And because we focused too much on politics, we ended up by seeding the cultural institutions of education and everything else to people. And it makes our task even that much more difficult. So as I say, who will be the adults in the room here? We have to address these difficult questions and the essays in the book are all variously taking up these different essays. The, ocean, the notion of the monetary mischief and the balance sheet of the Fed. The fiscal responsibility, intergenerational accounting, pathologies of privilege, and the structural distortions in the system. How do we address each one of those in a way that relates to the kids that are sitting in our classroom? The answer, this is in big, bold print, right? So you got to believe me. The answer uh, uh, to the dysfunctions of the state intervention is not more state. Uh, right. That, that's the that's a, you know, a bottom line of what I'm trying to, to say in the, in the book. Um, 
And what I try to argue here is that we have tools at our disposal. And what I want to suggest is that two of the most potent tools are F.A. Hayek and Jim Buchanan, because it's a one-two punch about the difficulties that are attributable to the contemporary consensus about how it is you organize an economy, basically macroeconomic management and microeconomic regulation. And that is Hayek's book, Tiger by the Tail, which is about the inflationary legacy of Keynes and democracy and deficit, which is about the fiscal irresponsibility and the politics of Keynes. And you take the two of those as bookends, and those are, should be the foundation for our treatment of addressing these questions that I just mentioned about our monetary mischief, our fiscal irresponsibility, and the pathology of privilege. So I have a, another book that came out the following also this year, which is on this money and the rule of law. So it, it's going after one of those, uh, uh, you know, um, pillars of this. So I have two slides to finish up and then, then I'll turn it over to you, Tawny. Uh, so what do I think the task of our political, you know, young political economists today? So my first lesson to them is they should do a deep study of Milton Friedman. First of all, one of the things about Milton Friedman, which is so important, he's always smiled, right? He was never angry, right? He was a tremendous communicator because he found a way to relate to the audience in which he was talking to. And part of that is you need to learn how to communicate with clarity, all right? You need to learn how to communicate with clarity and compassion to your peers, to your students, and to the general public. Friedman is a master at that. So we should adopt that. What are we going to learn from Buchanan? We're going to challenge those elitist presumptions, the utilitarian social engineers, elitists that dominate economics from the Social Science Research Council all the way up until today. So, you know, if, if you want to get a, a good sense of, of the attitude of the standard con, uh, contemporary economist, just read Paul Krugman. Uh, just not, not that Paul Krugman represents economics, but just his tone that he has. He's a, he, right? He's, going to be a, he believes he understands what the right preferences are, and he knows how to fix them, or Jeffrey Sachs, or anyone like that. Learn from Hayek, which is to excite the minds of the next generation. As Hayek says, science is generated either out of a sense of awe or out of a sense of necessity, and he believes that the sense of awe attracts our greater curiosity, and so that's to understand the spontaneous order of the market, and, and understand that aspect and the beauty of all of that. And then finally, back to Adam Smith to learn from his kindness and generosity as he exhibits in, this, in, in, in the, the theory of moral sentiment, and yet also his analytical acuteness and historical judgment. And I think if we learn from Friedman, we learn from Buchanan, we learn from Hayek, and most of all, we learn from Adam Smith, we'll actually be able to then speak to our students in a way that that resonates with them. And uh, anyway, this is just my, my standard, uh, you know, thing about the four pillars of economics. I think that, you know, economics teaches us, the science of economics teaches us the truth and the light, which is about scarcity and the trade-offs. It teaches us the awe and beauty of spontaneous order and complex coordination. It actually provides hope for us which is the great fact of history and the improvement through changes in the rules of interaction that enable individuals to pursue productive specialization and realize peaceful social cooperation. Just to understand something in 2000 and uh, uh, was it 2015, I think, is the first time in human history that less than 10% of the world's population was living in extreme poverty. If you just go back to when I was in college, 30% of the population of the world was living in extreme poverty. Just 10 years earlier of that, it was greater than 50% of the world was living in extreme poverty. You have to understand what that means and what great hope that brings to people to be able to have the benefits of modern economic growth. Uh, in terms of not eating growth rates, but life expectancy, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, your health, uh, human well-being, happiness, all of these issues, educational attainment for females, opportunities for minorities, all of those things 
improve with economic growth and they get curtailed when economic growth is, uh, uh, you know, reversed. And then finally, te economics teaches us with compassion. So as teachers of economics, what we want to do is we want to enlist the curiosity of our students and discipline their compassion with the reasoning of economics, but not to deter their compassion, but to give their compassion discipline so that intending to do well doesn't substitute for actually doing well. And so that's a function of understanding the interaction between incentives and institutions and you go from there. So that is my basic message of the book that I hope to communicate in the book to people over these 20 years. And I hope it uh, excites the curiosity and the compassion of people so that they can pick up with it and go much further with it than I was ever able to do. So thank you. Thank you, Pete. I appreciate it. Um, we are going to hear from our co-hosts first in a fireside chat with you. As you will notice in your video, we have classes joining us. We have community members from all parts of the United States. We're excited, and with this excitement, I now turn to Northwood University. Alex, are you out there? Hi. Hi, Alex. Can you guys hear me? Hello. Uh, thank you, Tony. Hello and greetings from uh, Midland, Michigan, from Northwood University, uh, America's Free Enterprise University, and uh, I'm glad to see Peter again. Last time, I think we were together at Hillsdale for the Austrian Economics Conference. <laughs> I, uh, I grew up uh, on the wrong side of the Berlin Wall, um, and I grew up as a Marxist, and uh, I walked all the way from Marxism to classical liberalism. So I have a question. In an environment in which um, almost no one wants to listen to opposing views, and uh, people typically only seek confirmation from others for what they already believe to be the absolute truth. Uh, Peter, what, what is the most powerful argument? If, if you have someone in front of you who hasn't made up their mind 100% and are not dogmatic, who, who can keep an open mind and um, are willing to consider the possibility that they might be wrong as I did back in 1989, um, 1989, sorry. <laughs> So my question is, what is the most powerful argument in favor of classical liberalism? Why shouldn't I embrace democratic socialism or some middle of the road idea? Why classical liberalism? So it's a great question. Uh, my own particular view would focus on the, the science of economics is a science that allows us to analyze the effectiveness of means to chosen ends. So you treat the ends as given of what it is that the socialist advocate wants to achieve. And then you add, and then they also choose the certain means. And then what you do is you analyze the effectiveness of those means to those given ends. And you, you know, and you examine that very carefully, having to do with the idea of do they satisfy the incentive effects? Do they handle the informational aspects of it? and you move on. But it's also the case that I think that we can, so if you think about what you're asking me, there's two different questions. Do I focus on the impossibility of them to be able to achieve the goals that they hope to achieve with respect to the means that they're choosing to uh, pursue those goals? That's vital, I think. But it's also the case of if even they could achieve those goals with those means, would we view that as a desirable society? So I think it's important to understand that the command and control sort of approach to economic life is actually a way that, that takes away from the autonomy and freedom of individuals. And so we need to focus on the issue of what kind of freedom, what kind of responsibility, what is a society of free and responsible individuals like? Is it one that subjects itself to command and control? And by the way, we've just lived through a very, uh, uh, you know, real experiment with this. And, uh, and keep in mind that I, I'm 61 years old, I'm overweight, 
I lined up to get shot in my arm as fast as possible, you know, whatever. Um, I've been very cautious about all these things like that. But I also think that the mandates and, and everything that has been done and the way we've handled a, a potential externality is a very ham-fisted way for us to handle it. And that there are other ways. I have a paper coming out in the Georgetown Law Review, which is on the issue of liberalism tested, which is how could a uh, following a John Stuart Mill harm principle position, how could you actually have reasoned your way through something like the global pandemic? Um, because that's not the approach that we did. We adopted a command and control approach rather than a polycentric approach. And so again, I think that thought experiment is very valuable for us to, uh, to examine. So in addition to the, to the consequentialist problem, there also is a deeper problem about what is the nature of a free society that we need to address. And I, and, and I think, Alex, that when we talk to people that disagree with us, Kate's here, and one of the best lines I ever heard in my life was from Dave Schmitz, who told a group of students when we both were very young, he was teaching at Yale at the time, I was teaching at NYU, and we were at a conference together and students asked about, you know, uh, how is it to deal in a world where people disagree with you or whatever? And Dave made this great line. He said, look, your life is too short and your colleagues are too interesting for you to ignore them just because you disagree with them. So you gotta find ways to communicate with people that you disagree with, to be a lifelong learner, and in doing that, maybe they won't be persuaded, but the third party that's watching the way you interact with them might become very persuaded that, hey, this person's reasonable and they're learning and that's attractive and they want to do that as well. So I think that's what we need to do. Thank you both, Alex and Peter. Now we're going to turn to another co-host, and that's Northern Michigan University's Joshua. Joshua. Uh, yes. Can you hear me, Dr. Becky? Yes, Josh, I can hear you. It's, Pete, uh, well, anyway. I, I, it's, it's for the audience, the general. <laughs> um, I should say, uh, while I am representing Northern, I'm only a couple miles from you uh, down the road in Fairfax, Virginia. And uh, this question isn't just for me. It's from your good friend, uh, uh, Dr. David Prochitko. And so if it seems a little like I'm twisting the knife here, don't blame me. And I've got a, kind of a short follow-up. And that question is, given that uh, this book is directed to addressing the conversation uh, with young people and people who are maybe just becoming acquainted with sort of the um, uh, political economy issues, why doesn't the book address sort of the looming potential economic catastrophes that young people care about, like uh, the environment or social justice or uh, racism, that kind of thing that's part of the uh, discourse. And then my quick follow-up would be, how would sort of a Smithian or Betke framework uh, include those aspects in the conversation? Okay, so so I'm gonna I'm gonna actually push back a little bit uh, to to Dave uh, in the following sense and to you is that the book does actually address the issues having to do with social justice and with racism and inequality. As I said earlier, you know I had the monetary mischief, the fiscal irresponsibility. But the third one is pathologies of privilege. And in the reconstruction of the liberal project, which I am arguing quite a bit in the book in various different essays, as well as the introduction and the conclusion, I am insisting on the liberalism of the, the liberalness of liberalism and embracing the issue of the kind of concerns that people have in the introduction. I even uh, try to leverage Frederick Douglass and his, uh, you know, uh, message on uh, what is the 4th of July to the, uh, you know, the slave and the challenge of that. I address the issue having to do with, with the murder of George Floyd um, and these kind of issues and how a liberal would, would deal with those things. Um, and, uh, and, and that's also addressed, again, in the conclusion 
uh, which tries to, again, address to young people um, uh, these issues. The one issue I don't talk about in the book is climate change. And climate change is a looming uh, issue with many young people, and, and rightfully so in many ways. But uh, part of the issue with that is that um, I think that there's a fantastic book out right now by Matt Kahn called uh, Adapting to Climate Change, in which what you need to look at is the way in which the price system can, in fact, uh, guide us, despite all the criticisms to the contrary, how it is that the price system actually guides us in uh, addressing issues of conservation and, and, and the improvement of the environment. So for example, if you wanna know why it is that California has a problem with water, well, maybe you should look at the policies that California has on the pricing of water to the various different farmers in California, which is all about political privilege. Or if you wanna know why it is that people build in fire prone zones, well, why don't you look at the zoning laws that exist that prevent the building of, of other you know, housing units and this. This is all the stuff that, that Matt Kahn goes into. Uh, Matt Kahn was the former department chair at Johns Hopkins University. He's now a chaired professor at USC um, in California. And so, and, and the book is published by Yale. Um, so anyway, I, I don't deal with that because I didn't wanna distract from the other issues. The one other thing I would say, Josh, is that in the conclusion, I try to make an argument about civility and the importance of civility in our public space, um, drawing on a University of Chicago sociologist, Ed Schills. And it, he makes a distinction between what he calls um, machine politics, ideological politics, and responsible politics. And his argument is that it's only when we have civility at the highest levels of government, okay, that we can have responsible politics. What we have currently in America is actually machine, po ideological politics that got translated into machine politics. Basically, you know, we're a, a, a country that has an ideological veneer for boss tweed. OK, so it's all about machine politics. And that means about doling the rents to your favorite group that are part of that. And we use ideological rhetoric to cover it. OK, um, but what we don't have is responsible politics. And for the adults to be in the room, we have to go back again and get to a level where we could have responsible politics. But in order to be able to have that, we're going to have to have civility at the highest levels of government. And that, you know, that's like, you know, to use modern economic research, that's what like Jesse Shapiro and Matt Genstow are picking up is not available, right? In their examination of the congressional record, you know, from, from the uh, 1780s all the way up to today and looking at political divisiveness, we've become more politically divisive, less civil at the center level than we ever were except prior to the Civil War. And so we have to really address that issue, I think, in order to fix uh, the ailments in our nation. So yeah, you had a follow up. You know, just uh, what you kind of included in that, which was just how do you, would you go about engaging those topics with young people, which I think you uh, covered in there. Um, yeah, so I have a chapter in there. You should point this out to Dave. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, by the way, the funny thing about it is Dave is one of the people who the book is dedicated to. So he, he's sticking his knife into to me again. Thank you. So just tell him, remind him that uh, and tell him that uh, in the grand tradition, I'm allocating all my errors to him. But anyway, the, uh, 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 I have you know, a chapter in there which talks about the reception of free to choose and how it is that Milton Friedman's free to choose was received versus say the way capitalism and freedom was received. And that's to, and so what I wanna, in doing that chapter, I'm asking myself also the question, how is it that works like this are getting received today by kids? And I agree with you that a lot of the kids might not, you know, this might be a swing and a miss. And so that means I gotta go back to the drawing board. That goes back to the struggle before. So Tawani's an expert economic educator. I'm an economic educator. 
Here's one of the things that both Tawny and I know by being an economic educator. Teaching is a two-way street. You begin where the students are. Yeah, we would all love it if the students began where we were. It would make our job so much easier. But you know, we swing and we miss all the time because we get confused and we think, oh, we're just gonna present like a watered down version of our PhD courses because that's the easiest way for us to you know, get our classes done. But if we do that, we're just gonna swing and miss with the students. So what we need to do is start where they are. And that's a constant learning because it's constantly changing where they are. And you have to be willing to allow an 18 year old to frame the discussion about how it is that you're trying to teach them economics, because that's where it, we must begin where they are and then bring them along this way. And just remind Dave of something when we were both beginning teachers, I was all upset because I didn't understand why every student that I had didn't have the same experience I had with economics, which was like, you know, a, a conversion experience like Saul on the road to Damascus or whatever, right? And so Dave said to me, Pete, you have to remember, we're the weird ones, <laughs> right? Of all the kids that were in that class with you when you were learning economics, how many of them decided to go to graduate school in economics? And I'm like, just me, <laughs> you know, like that? And he's like, see, we're the weird ones. And so I, I think we have to begin where they are because they're not where we are. They are where they are. And that's the only way we can teach them. My favorite pedagogical book is about John Wooden. It's called, You Haven't Taught Until They've Learned. And it's about his technique as a coach and why he was such a successful coach. And so you haven't taught until they've learned. And I think that's a really important way to think for us to think about what we need to do as teachers. So there, thank you. Tell Dave, I said, thanks. Yeah. Will do, thank you. Hey Pete, you mentioned chapter 14 on the reception of free to choose. May I share that with interested parties? Sure. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. So, yep, if you're interested, just reach out to us and we will share chapter 14, the reception of free to choose from the struggle for a better world. So thank you both. Now we're going to turn to Concordia University, Chicago with Rachel Ferguson. Rachel, are Hello. you out there? Yep, I'm right here. Can you hear me? Yep. Good. Hi, Pete. Hi, um, Rachel. How are you? Good. Uh, thank you for your talk. I'm trying to take your advice and think about some of the questions and concerns that are very current, right? And so I'm thinking... Classical liberalism is several hundred years old uh, in terms of its birth, its origins. And, and the world today, uh, one might say that things have changed, well, maybe more drastically than any other time in the history of the human race, except for maybe switching from hunter-gatherer to agriculture, you know, in terms of the economic growth all over the world and globalization and all of this. And so couldn't someone argue that we now have new problems that might not have even been anticipated by the thinkers of that time? For instance, we have corporations that are wealthier than nations, right? Uh, than small nations. We have social media companies that are more powerful than governments in terms of the amount of influence that they can, can wield. And you certainly see people wondering whether, you know, our human lizard brains, right, our, our, our pounding amygdalas can even resist, you know, the power of uh, some of these highly technological, technologically advanced tools. And so might someone say, hey, look, you know, that made sense 250 years ago, but now it's given birth to a whole set of new kinds of power. And the old saw about making sure you have a minimal state is just no longer the thing we're most worried about. How would you respond to something like that? Um, I think those are very, you know, important points. Hayek begins the constitution of liberty by pointing out that the old truths need to be restated with each generation uh, because either they no longer ring true or they don't apply to the existing conditions. So you have to think through 
all the time. So you can't even go to back to 1960 and say, you know, you can't be Margaret Thatcher and hold up constitutional liberty and say, this is our Bible or whatever. That doesn't hold anymore. We're in a different world. We have different problems that we have to address and we have to update it. So what I would say to you is that the general principles of what liberalism are about, though, can still be applied. We're one another's dignified equals. So we believe in, in universal human rights, and we want to protect those, those human universal rights. But at the same time, the way we want to protect them is in a political system that exhibits neither discrimination nor domination, right? So we can't have discriminatory politics favoring one group at the expense of other groups. And so we pass all our political uh, moves through a generality norm, right? But at the same time, we also have to have a non-domination you know, criteria, because if we're one another's dignified equals, that means that none of us have the right to dominate over other ones. Now, think through that consistently with respect to these new forms of power that you're talking about. And we might end up with a very radical position about how we address sources of, of power and privilege in society. So go back to my talk and go back to Adam Smith. And the whole point about economic liberalism as well as political liberalism was the eradication of the powers and privileges of elites. That's what you're trying to tear down. And so, by the way, I should may say a word about elites very quickly because I don't want to give the wrong impression. If I was before we started talking, I was congratulating Tawny on the great success of the Cardinals at the back end of the season, right? And I don't, when I tear down elites, you know, the sort of elite presumptions, I don't mean that like I could go out there and pitch for the Cardinals in the fifth game of, you know, one of the, 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 the you know, in the wild card game, right? I couldn't have gone out there and said like, let me pitch, I can do it, you know? Uh, I, I in fact love the expert that there's, but the issue is that we don't have any monopoly experts. Right. So, you know, the, the, the great experts that we watch and enjoy playing baseball are under constant contestation by other experts. That's what makes the game. So think an economist should be under that same kind of idea. There, there's there. We don't have any privileged position, though. Some economists are very talented and good and everything like that. But no one should have monopoly privilege of their expertise. So we don't need monopoly experts. That doesn't mean we don't have experts. We just don't have monopoly experts. And we need to have constant nodes of contestation, which means that in politics, what we need to have is polycentricism, constant nodes of contestation throughout the society so that you can have experimentation and learning from that experimentation rather than the idea of one size fits all policy. So again, if there's a takeaway, Ordinary people can do extraordinary things if just given the freedom. We don't need extraordinary people to do extraordinary things if they're given power, okay? And the other one is, why don't we need extraordinary people to do extraordinary things? Is because one size doesn't fit all. So therefore, we can't rely on that monopoly expert to be able to achieve the kind of concerns that people care about. The, the final thing I would say on, on a lot of these issues, and this is my economist bias, so this might get me in trouble with a lot of people, but I actually think facts matter. And when you read a lot of critics of, of the liberal order, they actually never give you facts, right? So like, you know, if you read a book like uh, by Ira Katz Nelson on the Great Depression, um, and the New Deal. You would never have an analysis of whether or not the New Deal policies produce the results that they want it to produce, right? Just like if you read a lot of people talk about, let's say, what went on in the Great Society programs of, you know, Johnson and the idea of trying to eradicate the problems of poverty and, and racism and whatnot in society, it, intending to do well is not the same thing as doing well. And that's an empirical question. Do these means achieve those desired ends? And part of the problem in the cultural zeitgeist is that people are doing an aesthetic, not a enlightenment project. 
This is why someone like Steven Pinker's book on enlightenment now matters, or Hans Riesling's book, Factfulness, matters, because facts do matter. They should have a feedback. Science should hurt. When I, you know, if I, as I said here, we operate constantly on the edge of error and on the edge of discovery. When we are in the edge of error and we make error, we should get smacked upside the head. That's how science progresses. And so facts should, should, facts are not the final adjudicator. I'm not saying that facts don't speak for themselves, but in part of the argument that we make, we use reason and we use evidence. And when you adopt an aesthetic possession, you don't use reason and evidence, you paint a picture. And that picture is immune from any kind of rational criticism. And when we deny rationality in our democratic deliberations, all we're left with is emotions and feelings. And that's not going to get us anywhere closer to a solution to our problems. So again, I understand that people don't like that because we live in, a, an, a, in an age of outrage. But in many ways, what we need to do is calm the outrage, insist on factfulness, and admit when, when our side is not like paying attention to the facts, right? So I just, I just had a fantastic talk in my class yesterday by a social historian named Emma Griffin. She's currently the, uh, the, uh, the president of the Royal Historical Association in England. She's written these two books on the Industrial Revolution. One of them's called Liberty Dawn, Liberty's Dawn. E Tawny's an economic historian. You know, uh, uh, any, any economic historian would read that book and be very excited about it because it kind of shows the progress of what happened in the, in the 19th century in England due to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the freeing up of labor because of the, the getting rid of the apprentice laws and all kinds of things like moving from the countryside to the cities and what it all gave us. And the book is very positive. But then she followed it up with a second book called Breadwinners. And what she then does is do micro history of women and children. All right. And then shows that, you know, when husbands, which were far greater than what we would like to believe, were in fact bad husbands, <laughs> they drank what they earned. So real wages, you know, for laborers were going up in the 19th century. But how did those real wages get spent? Sometimes they got spent in the household, but other times they got spent because the husband just wanted to take them and abscond with them and go and, and everything like that. But what was the problem? Women didn't have property rights. Women didn't even have the right to divorce and remarry at the time. And so women were kind of stuck in this horrible situation, not because capitalism you know, was terrible to them, that's the wrong message to get from it. People interpret that. But actually, because we didn't extend liberal institutions to women. Liberalism was incomplete. It didn't recognize women as full owners of themselves and of their property. And until we got the rise of women's rights, and then women being able to check by having exit options, the abusiveness of their spouses, they were vulnerable. And what Emma does is she focuses on those vulnerable at that time to problematize the 19th century. And classical liberals would be silly if they didn't pay attention to the status of women, a status of children, the status of minorities due to the imperfect institutions under which people were operating at that time. And so I think that that's what we need to do in talking to the kids today. We need to recognize the, the, the problematic past and wrestle with it, but then also talk about how it is that these instant that liberalism is a revolution yet to be fulfilled, whereas socialism was a revolution that actually, you know, collapsed. So anyway, that's that's how I would tackle it. So and I love the dog. <laughs> Thank you. That is my daughter-in-law. Oh, okay. <laughs> and that's Tulip. Anyway, now turning to, thank you, Rachel, turning to West Virginia University. Hi, Pete. Hi, Kate. Kate. How are you? Kate Johnson here. Um, I have a short question, and uh, you may have, you may feel like you've answered it already, but if you don't mind, give it another shot. 
So when is liberalism all about letting people be, you know, minding your own business and the ideal of living a quiet, peaceful life? And when is liberalism something that has to be fought for? Oh. How do you know, do you know when the world has crossed that line and it's time to make your stand? It is a great, it's actually a really great question. My, um, you know, Frank Knight uh, used to say that uh, you know, the point of, of uh, you know, good economics and good policy would be that we'd be able to live a quiet life. And uh, when I was in Russia, I was a, a fellow at the Academy of Sciences in Russia at the very beginning of the transition. And um, I had this, the Academy of Science gave me a scientific, uh, you know, advisor and then a cultural advisor. So my days were split where I would go and do interviews with all these people in the various different branches of government doing the reforms. And then I would experience Russian life with this, you know, and both of them, by the way, were PhDs. But again, like put things in perspective, they had, uh, you know, multiple kids. Uh, they were living in a, an apartment, which was a one bedroom apartment with both of their mothers, you know, we're in there, plus three kids and two people, and it was a one-bedroom apartment, and they were high-end academics, right? I mean, they were, they were, you know, fancy people, so you have to understand what quality of life was like in here, and I was walk, we were walking around, and I was fascinated by the price spreads, right? So, so I'd go to one area of, of Moscow, and the price of the, you know, the exchange ratio between the ruble and the dollar was this, you go to another one, and it was like wild. And I was like fascinated by all this because economic theory would teach me that there'd be a way to arbitrage between these, right? And so why shouldn't we be saying this? And she turned to me at one point, and she said, do you find this fascinating, don't you? And I said, yeah, I mean, it's just amazing. She goes, I just want to live a quiet life. She goes, I spend five hours every one of my day trying to stretch our budget. And going all over the city to try to do this because it's such a mess. It's chaos. But I have to spend five hours. I get done, you know, walking you around. And then I got to spend five hours shopping, you know, to be able to fit this family that I, you know, have to take care of. And that like dawned on me. It was like, oh, my God, like, you know, this is a horrible existence that they're living through. And this is what Frank Knight was trying to get us to think about. So I think that we're constantly in a struggle, but we have various moments where we have small victories that give us some relief for the moment. And part of that is these tacit presuppositions. So I do think that there was a slight period of time in the 1980s into the 1990s where the tacit presupposition was that individuals should be allowed to have freedom to decide how they are going to live their lives, how they are going to pursue their uh, material wants, but also whatever other kinds of things that they want to do, and they should be left free alone, and that we can agree to disagree, that we can live in a pluralistic society. But we we lost that, and we certainly don't have that today. Um, as much progress has been made over the, the 25 years, and don't get me wrong, a lot of progress has been made, we, we now live in a world where people are much more... Uh, cocksure that their position is the right position and other positions should not be uttered. And therefore, that means that we need full-throated defenses of liberalism at the moment, full-throated defenses of international trade, of migration, of, you know, entrepreneurship or permiss permissionless entrepreneurship, uh, of the right of people to actually make money. And, and, and enjoy the fruits of their money or to decide not to make money and have the consequences of not making money. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's we have to get back, as Milt Friedman said it, I think, best right now, we have to get back to a world which respects our right to free, free to choose. And that requires us to battle at the moment because we're in a world right now where we're not free to choose. And so... It's, it's time right now uh, to really push, I think, for uh, understanding the basic principles of liberalism, updating the arguments for a liberal order, and providing full-throated defenses of the Enlightenment project, actually. That progress is indeed possible, and that progress is good for humanity. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Pete and Kate.
And now we're going to turn to our audience and look at some of the questions that have been submitted um, via chat. I want to thank everybody who did submit a question. I'm going to try to summarize them. Or would you like to pick and choose, Pete? What's your preference? No, you 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 pick them out because they're a little too complicated for me to pick out on the fly. Well, and I do think that there's a common theme. There are these tensions between people on the left and people on the right. And it, Nate DePalm is a person who's brought this forward and others have agreed. It seems that people are just so polarized in this day and age. They're aggressive, emotional, and it's hard to have conversations about the ideas that surround freedom. And to have conversations become more and more difficult. Do you have any suggestions on how these students who are defenders of liberty can initiate and participate in discussions without it being a battleground? Are we doomed as a society? Asks Nate. So I, I think the metaphor of the war of ideas is the wrong metaphor. I think the right metaphor is the exchange of ideas. And I think that you are being called upon to be an ambassador of an exchange of ideas. And the way to do that is, I, I have a suggestion in the book, which is uh, derived from the philosopher Daniel Dennett. And it's about Daniel Dennett's rules of engagement, um, which I think that you should hold to. And the counterweight to the Daniel's, Dennett, Daniel Dennett's rules of engagement is an essay by Paul Krugman, which was in the New York Times called Knaves, Fools, and Me. So Paul Krugman is asked the question, why is it that, you know, uh, you, you know, people disagree with you. And he says, well, when they disagree with me, they're either a knave or they're a fool or they agree with me, right? So, and he writes that in the New York Times. That's the opposite of the position that you want to have. So the Dennett rule begins with your ability to repeat back the argument of the person you're engaged in an intellectual exchange with, their position so well that they would and say, that's a really good summary of my position. And it's only after your ability to do that, that then, then you have the right to criticize with kindness. The second point that I would make is that in criticizing, I think that the rules from Milton Friedman are very good here. Um, so Kate, Tawny, and myself know Deirdre McCloskey for many years. And one of the things that Deirdre McCloskey often talks about is the difference during her time at the University of Chicago between the way that George Stigler would run a seminar and the way Milton Friedman would run a seminar. So Milton, so you would be in Milton Friedman's seminar, and uh, let me start with Stigler. You'd be in Stigler's seminar, and Stigler's seminar, Josh is giving the paper. And, and, and he would say, Josh, this paper is stupid. No one should ever write a paper like this. What you should have written is the paper I would have written. So now go do that, right? Whereas Milton Friedman, Josh gives the paper in Milton Friedman seminar, Josh, Milton Friedman would say, Josh, I'm not convinced by your argument, but in order for you to make your argument, you probably need to do A, B, and C. So why don't you go and do A, B, and C rather than what you're doing right now, which is, you know, uh, X, Y, and Z, you really need to do A, B, and C. So one is an imminent criticism, Friedman. The other one is a transcendent criticism, Stigler. And I think we need to actually follow Dennett's rules and then Friedman's example, right? So you don't try, you don't sit there and try to, you know, tell them that their whole system is the wrong way to think about it. You have to work with inside of their world to sort of say, so with climate change, right? You have to not sit there and say climate science is bunk or whatever. You're not going to get any traction on that. But what you will get traction with, maybe, at least to a third party person, maybe, is if you start out by saying, look, this is a serious problem. How is it that property rights arrangements might actually be a better way to handle that issue than state mandates, right? Um, and what are the costs and benefits? This is the way that, that uh, Matt Kahn does it. He says, he goes, I'm all for discussion of climate change. I just want to understand what the cost is and what the benefits are. So if you tell me zero emissions, what's the cost of that? What's the benefit of it that I get? So let's submit it to that kind of question. And economics helps us do that. And so I think we begin with Dennett's and then we work on imminent criticism. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, if I could say one other thing, I think uh, Nate DePalm mentions Mises' omnipotent government. Yeah. And I think that 
that is a fantastic read and that should be recommended to everyone in the group. So I'll reinforce recommending it. Well, but then he also brings our attention to university professors and Mises yeah. uh, claimed that they were partly responsible for the statism that just spread throughout, especially Eastern Europe or Germany. Yeah. Excuse me. So what can you can you help the students of today understand where they are and how to leverage these ideas in order to have the conversations that you're talking about? So I think one, uh, my general pragmatic advice uh, is, again, uh, to not be an activist. A lot of professors nowadays are what they call scholars activists. And so a lot of student response is to be an activist back. OK, that's kind of like what happened at Stanford with Niall Ferguson and, you know, where they were trying to take out the other kid who was trying to be. I, I think stay away from that completely. Instead, be a curious and learning student. So here's the first advice that I would give. Get, be the best student in that class. Like whatever the professor's assignment is, you you knock it out of the ballpark and then that professor will pay attention to you. Even if you disagree with them, they'll disagree even more. They'll, they'll want to pay attention to them. That's not true of every professor. I understand that. And I think that's a selection issue. You just stay away from professors who are not really in the business of being professors, but are in the business of being activists, whether right or left. You just stay away from them. I think that's the key issue. What you want to be is you want to find professors who, in fact, are lifelong learners and you yourself are a lifelong learner. And you want to be able to raise your hand in the classroom and nudge the conversation, but not in a way that like is trying to poke people in the eye, but instead invite them to have conversation with you. Think of this as a conversation that you're just initiating and just continue and be persistent at insisting on the conversation. That might be romantic view of education. Um, I went to a, a small college, Grove City College. Uh, many people that know economics think of Grove City College as very free market because Hans Senholtz was there. But the reality was is that most of my professors were some version of Christian socialism, right? They were, you know, very much sort of very inspired by the Book of Acts. They talked about Christianity in that kind of way and everything. And so that was the kind of framework that you're in. And I had tremendous conversations with my professors um, that I disagreed with the whole time I was in college. There. I was an econ philosophy major, and uh, you know I had to wrestle with those kind of ideas. And I, I'm not saying I was I was perfect because I was young. I probably did a lot of obnoxious things, uh, you know, like any student that is fully convinced that they know economics because you know, uh, and that can give all the answers. But I learned a tremendous amount from the fact that I had professors that disagreed with me and pushed me on arguments. And I think that students should be curious, be compassionate, and be willing to learn, but also be willing to discuss their ideas in an open and free environment with their professors. I think we should trust university professors um, to be better than, than their worst impulses. The reality is, is that their worst impulses are there on both sides of the fence, uh, no doubt, but we should try to get the conversation to move away from that and be about discussing ideas and not, you know, uh, uh, cheap shots and character flaws and things like that. And this brings us, I think, nicely into Callista's um, question, and she wants to draw our attention to the social justice movements such as Black, Black Lives Matters, Women's Rights, et cetera. How are these movements going to impact our views of, free market, of the free market economy in the long term if government continues to impose its social regulations and adds restrictions? So, I mean, there's a lot packed in there uh, yeah. and, uh, and, and I'm not gonna be able to do that. And I don't wanna be, uh, you know, misunderstood uh, but I'll risk it to some extent here. Um, so uh, I led a project on New Orleans uh, after Katrina. I was the principal investigator on this project. And if I would have said at that time, uh, New Orleans lives matter, 
it would have been rather silly for someone to come along and say, you know what, Oklahoma lives matter too, because you know there's disasters in Oklahoma, right? Because our attention was drawn to New Orleans because of what just happened in New Orleans. The focus of the Black Lives Matter movement starting in the spring of 2020, it existed before, but starting in spring of 2020 was because of a serious issue having to do with racial disparities in our criminal justice system. And so it made sense to focus on that issue and address that issue. Um, it's not an issue that's new, by the way. If you go and study Eleanor and Vincent Ostrom, they studied what the consequences were on black lives when we had consolidation of police services in the 1960s, all right? And they studied St. Louis, they studied you know, Los Angeles, they studied uh, Indianapolis, you know, they did these studies and you had the Unigov movement and the Unigov movement actually ended up by hurting the very lives that they were supposedly now going efficiently, you know, manage. They ended up by not having public safety and everything else. So we have to address the issues in our uh, criminal justice system. Uh, to, just to give you a factoid, um, and, uh, 20, so for males, 25 years uh, age, okay, 51% uh, of black males have been arrested for a non-traffic and non-violent, you know, crime, which means underage alcohol and drink and, and drugs, okay? Now, here's the other thing, 49% of white males under 25 age or rather have been, uh, you know, collected up by the cops for that. The difference is, is the white males get community service and other things like that. And the, the black males get put into the system, which means that, that for the rest of their life, they have to click a box because they got arrested and everything like that. That matters. That matters deeply. And there's something structurally wrong with our system from a liberal point of view. From a radical libertarian point of view, something is wrong. So forget like using liberals so people might get confused. Not just straight up libertarianism, Robert Nozick libertarianism, that is a wrong thing to have happen because what it's doing is engage in discriminatory politics. And so that needs to be you know, addressed. And so we need to be able to address these serious inequities that exist in our society um, because otherwise we're actually tone deaf to the concerns. And that's true also of, of women, of minorities in, in general, people of color in general, including immigrants and everything like that. And so to me, I think radical libertarianism, radical liberalism is actually an alternative way to provide a vision of social justice for the least advantage in society. And we need people to defend that position uh, strongly, which is, you know, one of open borders, free trade, right? All these things like that. That doesn't mean that, you know, I'm denying the fact that the Black Lives Matter movement was motivated by Marxism and, you know, that there's a whole issue having to do with Gramscian, you know, infiltration of the institutions and hollowing out of the institutions and all of that. I understand that that point of that issue. Uh, you know, Alex could talk about that. I mean, because a, a lot of this stuff was actually initiated uh, by and supported by uh, former, uh, you know, agents in the former regime, which was in fact to destabilize America um, and, and whatnot. We know that, and that they 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 were involved in all of that. But that doesn't matter for addressing the issue at the moment. The issue at the moment is one of respect of, of individual rights, of recognizing that we're one another's dignified equals, and what is a social system that follows from that recognition. So, yeah. And thank you. And then how do we go about um, having the conversation that you're encouraging us to have when we live within an educational system that seems to be populated heavily, at least with loud social activists um, that call themselves also scholars. We have the network media, we have social media, and we have big tech censorship. What can we do in order to advance ideas of liberty? I mean, <laughs> let yeah. me just, let me, I'll get to your question in a second, but I wanna clarify something from one of the participants, Emma, who mentioned issue in my four in my PowerPoint presentation, 
I don't say improving the welfare state. I say improving the welfare for the least advantage. Those are two different things. I, I do not believe that the welfare state as a means actually improves the, the welfare for the least advantage. So let me just clarify that. But let me let me try to take a, a, a stab at, at, at your view uh, or the question that was raised. Um, I think our conversations are extremely difficult at the moment, uh, precisely because of uh, the task. So going back to my talk, the tacit presuppositions that dominate our intellectual culture are ones that are alien to liberalism. Okay? Which means that when Jack Dorsey is deciding things at Twitter or Zuckerberg is deciding things at Facebook, they are deciding things which are radically anti-liberal positions. As I'm, on, as I'm using the term. And so unless they can be contested and new vehicles come about to test them. So for example, MySpace gave way to Facebook. So why is it that we haven't seen some new version challenge Facebook? And what I would say is I would like to look at what kind of, you know, so when, when we were thinking about having policy, to discuss, you know, the, the social media platforms. Zuckerberg showed up at Congress, didn't he? And he says, oh yes, we need to be regulated and I'll serve on that committee to regulate us. That's like George Stigler's capture theory, like right in front of your face. And instead people are like, oh, isn't Zuckerberg enlightened? He ain't enlightened. He's like a master rent seeker. And he knows exactly how to, how to engage in that rent-seeking behavior, which is what? Discriminatory politics. It's about power and privilege to be able to lord over others. And we need, to, we need to eradicate that. But the way you eradicate that is not through having antitrust regulation or something like that. It's by having competition, by opening up space. And so that's what we need to have. We need to rely on technology and technological progress to erode the market power of these powerful platforms. So I'll give you another example. When I, when I taught at, at New York University, it was during the, uh, the time when the Microsoft you know, wars were going on. People were worried about Microsoft monopoly and eventually Judge Jackson ruled on the monopoly. You know, it was about the browser wars. And one of the issues with the browser wars, if, if you remember, was the claim was is that when you got a Microsoft product, you automatically got Internet Explorer, and that that somehow was an unfair advantage to Microsoft. And at the time, the number one plat uh, uh, Internet tool that people used wasn't Internet Explorer. It was Netscape, which, by the way, isn't the one any uses today. But they use Netscape. And so I asked the students, you know, how many of you use Apple products? How many of you use Microsoft, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft products? Because that, again, was a big thing going on. All right. So then the client hand up. How many of you, you know, what's your, you know, how many use Netscape? And like 80% of the kids would raise their hand to use Netscape. They'd say, how many of you downloaded Netscape through Internet Explorer? And 100% of the kids that, you know, use Netscape did that. So do you understand that what that is, is that's a contestable market. It's not a monopolistic market because the very dominance of Internet Explorer was eroded by the competition. That's what we need to have. That's what I meant earlier when I was talking about contestation against experts, is we need to have constant nodes of contestation in our society. We need to actually unleash the powers of competition to eradicate the powers and privileges that individuals have amassed to themselves because of getting favor from the government. That's the pathology of politics, right? That's the pathology of, of privilege, is that, they, they, that we no longer live in a society of contract, but of connection. And if it's about a society of connection, that is this old regime. That's the ancient regime. That's not the liberal regime that Adam Smith advocated. It's mercantilism. We're in modern mercantilism when we have a society that's all about power and privileges, rather than the eradication of power and privileges through the power of the market. And so I think it's all about unleashing competition. That's what we need to do. And in order to do that effectively, 
You're going to have to have sound money, fiscal responsibility, open trade, right? Secure property rights, you know, and, and all these various things we associate with economic freedom because it's that economic freedom that opens up that space for us to be able to then interact. Um, and so that's why, you know, just to give a, a reference to everyone here, I think that a, the, one of the more powerful passages that someone could read is the last paragraph of Thomas Sowell's Knowledge and Decisions. So in the very, in the very end of Thomas Sowell's Knowledge and Decisions, he makes this point about the need to have elbow room so that individuals can have elbow room against those who they envision themselves as their betters. And we need to give that space to people to be able to have that you know, freedom. And the way you get that is through economic freedom. Well, Pete, our time with you has come to an end. I want to say thank you to everyone who joined us. If you're interested in staying in touch and learning how to support the Hammond Institute, please sign up for our newsletter. I apologize for not being able to get to all of the excellent questions. This was an engaging session one of the most engaged I think we've had in a long time. Please stay in touch. Reach out if you're interested in getting Chapter 14 of The Struggle for a Better World. And with that, I'm going to sign off. Um, Peter, do you have any last thoughts? I, I thank you very much for the opportunity and the Hammond Institute for giving me this and for the Langenberg family uh, for this opportunity. Um, it's a it's a great honor to give the this this talk and I hope that um, you know I lived up to uh, you know the the little pink booklets I used to get from Harry Langenberg about the trends uh, and, and for freedom in in our society because that's what we need today. Well, it's with great pleasure I say goodbye to all of you and see you next time. Please stay in touch and um, yeah, have a great evening, everyone. Thanks, Pete. Enjoy Thank your you. evening. Bye.